Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, obviously, if we were all in person, I'd have you know a couple of boxes of donuts for everybody. But since we're doing it on Zoom call, this is a little different for for me. Um, I've shared on on these presentations or in this format in years past. And once again, we just thank you guys for allowing us to you know be a part of it. Thank you, Deb, for organizing it and you know getting us together on this. Um, yeah, as as Deb said, um, my name is Derek Cruz, and I work for for Bellevue Healthcare. I'm an ATP. Um, uh, assistive technology professional and a seating mobility specialist. Um, and I've been in the industry for about 25 years um, following, you know, multiple generations um, of, of ATPs and, and people within the industry. Um, we um, are, you know, heavily involved in the Northwest with durable medical equipment. Um, mainly I'm on the complex rehab side of things, um, dealing with, you know, pediatrics, adults and, and, um, the elderly to get, um, you know, the more, uh, as I said, complex rehab equipment, wheelchairs, um, and, and, um, other ancillary or assistive devices out there. Um, my colleague that's, that's with me on the phone today, um, very knowledgeable, um, Lexi is, is been with us for, um, I'll let her share, but, but but a number of years now, and has worked with me side by side, um, and kind of gone through obviously the the COVID challenges, and then prior to that, um, a, a lot of learning curve with with some of the changes that have happened with insurances um, lately. Um, you know, like I said, last um, five to seven years, um, and it, just a, a huge help to me to try to understand um, uh, some of the process. For acquiring equipment, which is kind of the bulk of our our topic today, um, and I know there'll be a lot of questions that that get driven from that. Um, so um, before I, I dive into the thing, I'll let I'll let Lexi do a little quick um, introduction for herself there. But but thank you again for having us this morning. Yeah, hi, my name is Lexi. Um, been in the industry for about six and a half years. I mean, as Derek had mentioned, have kind of obviously started with a lot of the learning curve uh, of just insurance in general and acquiring equipment and medical necessity versus medically necessary and all of that kind of stuff. And then have seen a lot of the changes happen, new struggles occur, um, new policies, uh, policies dropped. Um, and so I am um, a lot of the knowledge behind the scenes of what Derek does. He definitely has the side of, um, you know, the equipment and knowing it specifically. And then I'm, I'm on, on the back end of how to, how can we get it through insurance and how can we qualify somebody and, you know, do they qualify or what's that path going to look like? So um, a lot of my knowledge is based out of that, um, but super excited to just help answer questions and just be kind of a resource for everybody um, on the call um, as well as after. Um, so yeah, we're just super excited to be here and, um, kind of navigate this world we're all in. In order to um, bridge the gap from the previous meeting, um, I had a chance um, in the last month to actually meet with a few therapists, a few of you guys. Um, and I wanted to just, um, once again, come back really quick to some of the emergency topics. Um, I really enjoyed some of that presentation last month regarding um, what what you guys are all dealing with, what um, what I think um, is, is pretty common out there regarding chairs that break down or emergency. Well, I guess I'll speak to the parts regarding the wheelchairs. I know that was a, a broad conversation last month, but, um, you know, my little input was basically um, covering some of the transit requirements, um, some of the things that get these chairs and assistive devices to and from school. Um, it, kind of some key points that I just wanted to follow up real quick because it might have been left on on the table a little bit. Um, um, and after speaking with with a couple of my my closer therapists in in the community, um, we we kind of came to the conclusion that um, that one of the biggest problems that that we're seeing is is when a piece of equipment um, breaks or has an issue and, um, the bus company or, or transportation is at a standstill, I guess, um, was like, what, what is the path and how to, how do we get that result? And the gentleman that was on, for, forgive me, I, I, I forgot his name, but the gentleman that was on last, last month, um, you know, made a, a, um, a truthful, uh, statement about like, well, you know, we should be able to, um, tune it and adjust it with our with our own tools or gain those skills um, within the school to get that done or just you know dial up your your local 
uh, vendor, ATP, somebody like myself or a technician to to come and get that 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 problem solved. Um, the 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 issue there or the feedback um, that I received is that isn't necessarily a reality in each of the school districts, and it, it wasn't necessarily um, a reality for the majority of the classrooms that that I was was going into or still go into um, to do some of these little emergency repairs um, and modifications. Um, and so I, I think in in the couple of conversations that I had, the the add on to that conversation was um, probably establishing a good line of communication with the um, vendor who provided the piece of equipment. And the extra um, little asterisk next to that is if you're fortunate enough to be in an area where, um, you know, there are multiple providers like the Portland area, then you can just take that one step further and hopefully have um, some outside connections or relationships where that vendor or supplier is willing to touch. I know I know this is the big the scary part right here. Are we willing to touch someone else's equipment that we did not provide? Um, and um, if I didn't say it last month, I'm saying it now. Um, I believe ethically it's our responsibility as the suppliers or as the people that are knowledgeable in the equipment. Um, to to offer up those services, especially if it helps our kids um, get to and from school or helps them get out of a sticky situation, right? Um, where where you guys just don't have um, any answers, um, a broken brake, a broken foot rest, a broken harness, something that um, prohibited them from um, moving to, to and from school. Um, I know I'm gonna rush, rush out over the top of that conversation, but um, you know, I, I think that a lot of, it, in conclusion, a lot of my success with the relationships that, that that I've built in the area, and I and I hope that it's only a model for other ATPs out there, has been to offer those services and be there um, as a connection to um, to solve some of these problems. And I do tell um, you know all of my therapists, um, please speak up in the comments or or get on get on this chat if 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 need be. Um, I speak up to a majority of my contacts and just say. Hey, let me know if there's something I can I can tune for you or adjust for you or work on um, for you, even if it's not my chair, because um, it's not a big deal. And you're not um, you're not bothering us, um, you know, with somebody else's equipment. Um, you know, we're, we're here. We're here to help. Um, finally, I, I, I think in the conversation, I, I just said, once again, establish those connections, try to find the path of least resistance to get to your vendor or get to the supplier. What does that mean? Um, I was I, I was really fixated on the fact that like the primary therapist or the primary person that is identifying the problem. Let's take an example of a broken break where the child's chair, um, you know, can't go on the bus or a wheels wheels falling off or, you know, they don't have a transit option. Hopefully you have a direct contact to somebody within one of our companies out there in the area that you can reach out to. And um, as opposed to going through 27 people, you know, 25 of them are, are, are secretaries or support people. And then you finally get to the technician or you finally get to the ATP. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of, of problems would be alleviated if, if um, you know, you can identify at the beginning of the school year or identify at some point, you know, um, within within the, the classroom community, like who did the chair, who is the main primary person for for the chair um, at that at that company. And then how do I get to that vendor? Um, so um, less hurdles to jump over, I guess, is my point. So. so what I hear you saying, Derek, is communication and planning up front is key and that you are a phone a friend for uh, just about anybody who's on this call and, and across the, the state. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, absolutely. And I would put it out to all of my peers within the supplier and the vendor community that you better do the same thing. <laughs> okay. Well, and you started off with talking about a follow-up to a meeting uh, from last month uh, that was at our town hall. Mm -hmm. And with the 60 people on, I just wanted to provide a resource and just a little bit of framework around that. Um, uh, and, and so I'm just going to go to our 
um, newsletter. Um, and Aaron and I always put out a bit of a summary. And I'm going to put a link, but I just wanted to say that we started this conversation at and invited Derek um, for our November town hall uh, when the question was the therapist role in collaboration for safe bus transportation. And so that came from somebody who I believe is on with us today. So I hope she really appreciates and that you all appreciate where this took us because it I we we're all about impacting change and communication is where it starts. So Alex Hayslip has been with us um, with the statewide planning for emergency pieces. He brought a little bit of the conversation about training. Uh, one thing I want you to know is that there may be a ch name change, a bit of a change in what we've called the PEEP, the personal emergency and evacuation plan, uh, to be the personal emergency accommodation plan. As they share that across the state, uh, folks think it'll be clearer if it's not all about emergency and evacuation, that it's an everyday plan. So uh, Derek, of course, talked and he provided some links. And this is why I really wanted to share this is because he provided some things from the University of Me uh, Michigan. Um, he also, of course, is doing today's session. But uh, Aaron uh, Bompiani had also invited some folks who just presented at a conference that she was at. And they have a wonderful fact sheet that you may want to take a look at. Uh, lots of other conf uh, pieces that were shared. And then this week um, on Monday, we had Brock Didas, who is with ODE. He is all about uh, transportation and the fingerprinting unit. So he's got a couple of things uh, under his umbrella. Uh, but you'll want to see that conversation um, about the training that our uh, bus, um, but the, the bus drivers get across the country. So I just wanted to uh, pardon me for interrupting you, Derek. I didn't want to. No, assume, no, appreciate it. I didn't yeah, want no, to assume it. that everybody on with us uh, knew about that conversation, but want to make you. sure they have resources uh, like everybody did uh, who was there. So yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think you know today talking about equipment and and some of these um, questions that have come up. I want to get back into a, a couple that were in the um, in the chat there. Um, from um, from Bruce and from way up top, where is it at? Carrie, um, you know, I guess that what I'm reading from that is is that the schools have gotten a little bit more strict. Um, just to tie on to what I just said, a little bit more strict about us coming in and doing modifications and adjustments. I've seen a little bit of a glimpse of that um, it, within. I, I can't pick on any one school district, but um, I definitely know that there is a lot more vendor check-in um, or issues with technicians and, and people like myself to come in and do all of the things that I just discussed. Um, but you know what, we're just navigating that a, as it comes. And in most cases, our therapists, you guys, you know, give us a heads up on the front end that says like, oh, you know, hey, you're gonna get, you know, strip search before you, <laughs> before you go in and it's gonna be a problem, you know, and so, um, you know, if 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 that's the case and we and and we need to go through that, then then that's fine. Um, I know that in in past years, even, you know, right around pre pre COVID or, or during it, um, you know, sometimes we had to do work out in the parking lot and we had to, like, figure out how to get around the idea of um, and once again, hopefully I'm answering this question correctly of, of walking around a school or going into a school and messing with equipment. But once again, I can't um, pick on any one particular school district or you know school that I've been to that. Um, you know, that forced us to, to, to follow, you know, um, something of, of that degree, but it, it may increase obviously. So, um, so anyway, um, hopefully that answers those, those questions. Um, and once again, I just wanted to follow up from, from last week and thank you Deb for, for, you know, capping that off, um, you know, regarding the, the, the transportation or who to call and when to call and, and the fact that, you know, we should just all try to do our part to try to solve some of those issues because, at the end of that conversation last month, it's like I don't think there was any one definitive answer as to how to how to how to solve what we would all call an emergency. Um, and so. on big on the big picture, there are, is certain guidance, but we know that the point you're making about communication goes all the way to the person who's working directly with that student. And when you get there, hopefully you're talking to the bus driver and the right person and that you, you know, it's all about the student and you come to those places where our questions were really about what are they, what are they 
what are they trained to know? And is there a way that some of our therapists who are feeling uncertain about their role can be part of some of their training just so there's some shared uh, conversation? But really, it comes down to on your local level uh, communication, and that's probably going to take you a long way. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I'm seeing questions, questions about uh, funding, of course, and some of yeah. those new things. Uh, you, I see that you're monitoring the chat too, but... Um, yeah, a little bit. And then we have the, the two survey questions. And I think that the one probably to start with that was um, sent in regarding the um, uh, EDS, EPSDT policy and provisions. Um, Lexi and I had a chance to kind of review over some of that, bouncing back between some um, web pages and what we what we already know. Um, I think the end of our, our path on that, um, not the end, but, you know, we got pretty deep into the um, OHA statutes and some of the regulations um, in an attempt to try to answer um, this this first question that came over. Um, you know, I don't, I, my two cents, and I think I'll let Lexi just add a, a few comments to this. I don't um, know if I've seen too many impacts on denials or approvals based on, um, based on that particular policy and the lack because it, I guess it was suspended right so um, I'm not sure if I've seen um, if we've seen anything that was um, a big shift in in metal in, in coverage for this equipment over the last couple of years or any any changes that have really happened regarding um, approvals um, other than I know that um, within the vendor community um, um, and suppliers like us and some of the manufacturers, there has been the task force that task force. <laughs> there's been a, a group of people that have been um, working with the state regarding some of the verbiage, um, the, some of the descriptions, some of the way things are reviewed um, over the over a number of years. And there's some very, very smart people that are involved with that. And I feel like they have um, definitely made some um, gains in just the way that things are reviewed um, and, and approved. Um, just a little outside of that question, but I mean, meaning that, you know, it wasn't until a few years ago that, you know, everything was um, um, only deemed appropriate if it was in-home use. And that's been expanded to, um, you know, outside now. Um, and when I say outside, meaning that, you know, it's not an automatic um, denial or a, a rule that, you know, if you're going to use your manual chair or your power chair outside your house, that all of a sudden that's just not covered. Like little things like that have changed. It's recognized now that the school um, is is part of um, the um, activities of daily living or bus or the um, uh, doctor's appointments and other outside activities. But, um, you know, I, I once again, there there's some pretty smart people out there working with with um, the um, uh, Oregon Health Authority and 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 are working through the statutes and and working through the rewrites on some of this stuff. But I don't know, Lexi, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, a lot of um, with or um, specifically Oregon Medicaid and really any Medicaid, I guess in general, is it's all about that medical necessity and medical appropriateness. That's always what they're going to kind of fall back on, um, regardless of. Um, what other insurances they might have or where they're located or things like that. Cause it, it, it's all about for the child um, or the, the client and what they medically need uh, anything accessory wise um, that's, you know, convenient for a caregiver or, you know, an upgraded color choice, things like that. Like that, that's where we see a lot of these denials is kind of getting in. And we'll be really nice if we had this, but we already have something like it. Um, we see that a lot when it comes to like activity chairs um, and things like that, where insurances are pushing back um, on that. Um, but when it comes to, you know, specifically looking at the client's needs, this is their mobility for their, AD, you know, MRADLs and all of that kind of stuff that, that we're not seeing a ton um, of pushback on um, as long as it can be, you know, justified um, and really having, you know, the full picture um, is given to those reviewers on what it looks like for that child. Yeah, an example um, that we see often just to tie on to what, what Lexi just said, um, an example might be like the pursuit of some sort of activity chair, which we see a lot of at schools, for example, Riften activity chairs and other high-low bases and 
and um, and and even the pursuit of of, of feeding chairs or high chairs. Um, I see this at, at clinic and and some of the um, outside home health and and, and school settings. Um, you know, an example um, would be like uh, pursuing an activity chair when you just got a you know manual tilt and space wheelchair. Um, one of the things like like Lexi just said is is you know they're going to question why the wheelchair that has so much activity based justification behind it or at least it's supposed to cannot be used as the feeding chair or the um uh, the other activity chair why are we you know having to buy um a second um um a second piece of equipment for example you know a rift and activity chair or 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 something else that that may be used at the school um when the primary mobility device that we just spent x amount of dollars on um is now in play and has been authorized so um it's not that in that case the rift and chair isn't medically appropriate or can't be deemed assistive tech technology, but it's just, it's, it's a, it's a double up. It's, it's redundant when it comes to the fact that they just got a, you know, a primary power chair or a primary manual chair. So um, same and similar type, type verbiage there. So um, more questions will pop up. Um, I just want to give a little, a little spiel on anything that's new and maybe this will generate some, some other thoughts. Um, I, I wish, uh, I think I said this in years past, I wish that I could come with just a whole new menu or variety of just amazing things that you guys haven't already seen <laughs> in the research that you do out there. Um, I, it, unfortunately, and, and this will this will kind of answer, Lexi answered the question regarding sl uh, supply chains and manufacturers that I saw up on the chat. Um, due to the times, I don't think there's a lot of R&D that's happening, <laughs> meaning that I, I just don't feel like a lot of these manufacturers are spending a lot of money on the new improved widget. Um, you know, in the power chair world, um, all, all that's really happened is, is small adaptations to electronics, um, a few new seating components and, you know, the new color option that you can get on it. Um, and and I'm, I'm not doing them any favors by saying that, but it's just not a lot of things going on there. Um, notably, people like Rifton, which you guys all know, continue to develop things. They came out with a, um, I probably could have done slides on this, but they, they came out with a new stander um, considering they've had the the large wood table stand for so many years. And now they've actually got um, a, a standard that is more comparative to what Ultimate offers, another brand that you guys know, the Zings and the Bantams um, and some of those products. Um, so that's great. Um, I think that Rifton, you know, I always give them lots of props and kudos. They they continue to develop things that are very very useful at home and in the school setting. Um, that's 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 really great. Um, past that point, we've seen maybe a couple little adaptations to some of the manual chairs that are out there. Um, that being said, you're talking to a guy right now that is is pretty fixed on how I build chairs and put chairs together. And unfortunately that doesn't always welcome the brand new thing into, into my realm because there's so much consistency over the years with some of the products that are already out. Um, you ask a lot of ATPs um, that you might work with and, and most are gonna say that they, they get you know stuck on some of their favorite products and they just roll with them because if they've been successful, then um, you know, why change? Um, that's not an excuse to not learn and, and, and develop your skills and, and, and bring more product into your, into your folder. But at the same time, there's some stuff that we all know, um, is, is good in quality and is, is going to last. Um, the question regarding, um, the smart drive power assist wheels, which we could get to right now, um, and mainly was, you know, coverage criteria and what that actually looks like. In most of those instances where I've been working with Power Assist, um, and I guess for definition purposes for you guys on the call um, to answer you know, that question, Power Assist is basically anything, it's, it's one big category of power adaptation to a manual wheelchair. So that could mean um, a smart drive, which is a product, or a Invacare Smooth, um, smart drive made by Permobile, Smooth made by Invacare, or even um, the Twion um, or Emotion wheels that are actual power wheels that are applied to a wheelchair where the motor and, and battery source or energy source is in the actual wheel. This is all power assist. And most of those um, um, 
uh, pursuits of equipment have been done with with my adults. I mean, there's a few kids that that have had those. Um, but I think the 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 right off the top, the coverage for a lot of that stuff, um, barring that, you know, the insurance is, is willing to go down that path. Um, it usually starts with like, is, is it their first chair or have they had a chair and how much can you document or support um, the repetitive injuries, um, the um, need to, um, you know, keep a manual chair, but not move to a power chair, right? Because, you know, you're just, it, it's kind of that in between a manual chair and a power chair, kind of bridging that gap. Um, you know, the list goes on of, of reasons why, you know, you would you would want to really try to focus on like what this particular device is actually doing um, and why you're not choosing something else because they are they are rather expensive, um, you know, and and does it does it limit access or, um, you know, I know it, it'll it'll hustle a kid out during a, a fire emergency at the school, but like, will they use the smart drive or will they use these power assist devices, um, you know, amongst the the other um, uh, students in the classroom or will will it be a safe option in the other environments that it, that it might come into play? Um, Lexi, I can't remember whether Medicaid is is covering those or, or not. Um, I thought that that rule had changed over the last couple of years where for a while there, um, the power assist devices were, kind of off the board, which didn't make a lot of sense to me, but um, that they, um, with, with some of these rewrites on on the statutes and some of the um, willingness to accept the assistive tech devices, um, looking at them with more medical need that, that, that the coverage had came back. Is that is that right? Um, they are still currently not open for funding through Oregon Medicaid. Um, you can go through different routes, basically asking for an exception to that. Um, it does you know, obviously it takes a little bit more because it's not as simple as, you know, writing it up, submitting it and hoping to get for auth. There's quite a few extra steps with it in regards to justifying and basically asking the insurance companies to, will you make a one-time exception? Here's why. Um, so there is an avenue for it. It's just not, you know, a straight avenue. It's not as black and white as like with some of the other insurances on those. Hopefully that, yeah, smart drive or power assist devices are are uh, are very unique. I mean, I would, I'm open to, I mean, anybody can send me an email on that. It's probably a more involved conversation that would, you know, wouldn't use up a lot of time. Um, there's just so, so much criteria. I, I have my own soapbox regarding those because I just view them as, um, view the actual smart drive devices when you start breaking them down in their components and like what they do and how they work. Um, I think there should be multiple categories for these, these pieces of equipment. Um, just as an example, like a power assist wheel that is activated by a hand rim that a student might push is definitely different than banging a watch or spinning a dial and getting your cruise control motor in the back of your chair to drive you along. Both are going to move you and they both are going to turn a manual chair kind of into a power chair. But I just think there's just a whole bunch of different um, um, hierarchy of thinking and, and, and criteria that you would want to follow as you pursue those. And, and furthermore, I would say work with your vendor, supplier, me, um, to, to do demos if, if needed or trials to see if that um, is something that's that's feasible for um, the, the student's chair. Um, any question? I, I'm reading the chat. Any questions on on the it looks like people found the Riften, the Riften standard, the new one. Um, Carrie made a good point. Eye gaze driving st is still new to many folks. Yeah, I, I gaze I gaze equipment um, is is coming about. You know, it's it's out there and um, it's just a matter of whether the manufacturers um, of these power chairs are allowing that adaptation or have vetted all of that to make sure that it's safe and and works with with the companies, um, you know, so that so that there's no um, liability issues there. Um, so what else we got here? The new Rift and Trike is amazing. Um, yeah, the new Rift and Trike had an overhaul. Um, the Rift and Trike, um, uh, if anything, is definitely easier to break down. So if you guys are break down in a good way, take apart, um, meaning that if you're transporting it from school to school or from a loan closet out to the school, um, it definitely comes uh, comes apart easier and can be disassembled. Um, it's very, very adjustable without tools. Um, it did a, it did a major overhaul. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, uh, Terry. Um, I think that 
that that thing has um, it, it's come a long ways from the old metal frame, you know, chain driven uh, option down and, and, and some of those that have been around for so, so long. Um, yeah. So that's a, that, that's a good addition um, um, to the Ripton market for sure. Um, how long before Bruce, how long before a self-driving wheelchair became um, mature if they can get, okay. Um, the only self, let me comment on a self-driving wheelchair. So a couple of years ago, um, it, it, up at ISS, um, I think is where this was seen, um, a fellow manufacturer, the Bruce Group, was sharing with me that where we are on some, and maybe this is, this will tie this together, Bruce, um, that the camera systems that are being used now um, that are offered, um, actually, do you remember the camera uh, company that was... Um, Oh, it's right at the tip of my tongue, but they are mounting cameras on chairs now so that they can somewhat self-drive. And it's more of a safety issue um, or a safety uh, device um, where these cameras are positioned so that if there was any visual impairments that you could avoid those things. And they are they are very, very accurate um, along those lines. One of the things that I heard that was really neat was that that same camera could read barcodes. Um, or um, or stamps. Um, what, what are they? Um, um, look at how how old I am. That scanning the barcode, um, you know, that you would find on on any advertisement. Um, I had heard that the company was developing a way. Uh, give you an example to put a barcode on the ramp of your van, so that the camera would pick that up, send the information to the wheelchair self driving groups, right? And then it would have memorized the path into the vehicle so that you could navigate that very tight and precise environment um, and park your chair. Um, I heard I didn't see it. I heard about it. And so I think that opens up a huge door for, um, you know, future navigation and, and, and kind of along those lines of like self-driving. I mean, I think we're always going to be uh, many, many years behind Tesla and some of these other like, you know, self-driving um units but um you know it's coming along and 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 some of that stuff's getting offered out there Greta, if there is a status change would insurance rather provide an expensive power chair or something power assist um yeah i i think they'd rather i th i think it'd be easier to pursue a power chair than a power assist um but i also recognize the fact that um once again, diving into to to an evaluation where you would go through your options as to what um, whether you would choose a power assist or whether you would choose a power chair. I think that those those decisions, I, I think you should always choose what would be you know the most appropriate for the situation. And in the evaluation, you would go, do they have like a wheelchair van you know that could could transport a power chair? Uh, no, they have a um, they have a small sedan you know and, and you're like okay well then maybe we should focus our time and energy into the into the evaluation for a power assist that makes perfect sense um and like i said earlier in that case you would have a lot of narrative and, and ability to like start that conversation in, in writing right like to say hey we would pursue this but instead we've ruled that out and we're going to go with this because the manual chair is still functional the manual chair is still you know, um, the primary mobility device in these environments, you know, listing them out. And here's how the power assist wheels or power assist motor from the rear um, applied to that particular chair will benefit um, our, our client, our student, and um, and not completely upend, you know, their entire um, uh, pattern for how they do their day and how they get to and from school and stuff. So um, I think there's outside factors that kind of would would dictate that direction. And 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 that's how I operate in an evaluation. Just, just you know, you, you and I have worked together, Greta. I mean, you know, we, we come in and go like, hey, what's the reality of this situation? Um, it's obviously bigger and broader than just junior sitting right here in front of us in the classroom. Like, what's the home look like? What's the vehicle look like? What's the family's you know, ability to accept the piece of equipment and 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 understand how it works and what it does. And, you know, if mom and dad roll in right now and they look at this, you know, big old power chair, they immediately kind of be freaked out. You know, there's just little little things that would that would um, go along with that as far as um, making that decision on power chair versus versus um, versus power assist. What is the cheapest trike we can buy? 
Well, um, Shelly, I, I would, I'm only aware of a couple trikes, um, Rifton being one. And then, um, there's another company that, that I know the hospitals have used where they've had more of a bike, but trike option. Um, so kind of, yeah, freedom. Thank you, Greta. Um, yeah, you know, in, in that small list of options, as far as, as far as trikes, um, at the end of the day, um, I, I'm going to take a, a stab at this. I would say that the Riftons are are the cheapest, and the Riften uh, Riften itself is offering so much discount to the school based programs and and to us. Um, their stuff is still expensive, but um, you know, they there there's enough leeway in the in the in the the funding or the um, the uh, discounts, as if we want to call them that, that, that usually we can make um, make things work. Um, I would I would say that out loud because trikes aren't covered by insurance. And we get that question a lot. But Alexi, would you agree? I mean, can I get a trike covered through insurance? And and in most cases, not for for various reasons we've already talked about. But um, in that situation, it becomes like a crowdfunding, a private pay, or, or you know some other sort of funding source that would pay for a trike. So that's what I mean is that when you're in that world you know, uh, a supplier like, like us would, would come in and go, Hey, well, how, how do we make this work without, you know, losing money or, or what's fair or what's comparable to what I would offer to the, um, to the school districts or whatever, as far as, as pricing. So, um, you know, I think that that's, uh, um, the, the way to say, Hey, what, what is the cheapest is probably more about just looking at what's, what the offerings are and, and whether it, it it's going to work and then finding a price for it. So, um, thank you again for the freedom concepts. I had forgotten about the, you know that option. <laughs> I know that those ones go through the hospital um, hospital systems or the the bike community for sure. Um, kids have state funds, and we write letters to help families get bikes. Can you help me with getting it funded? Um, that's new to me, but I always am happy to. We are always happy to learn and figure out the process. Um, to pursue equipment, whether it's specialty beds or trikes, as we're talking about, um, any of those really unique items outside the primary mobility device. Um, um, you know, sometimes it, it looks like a massive mountain to climb um, as far as, you know, the hurdles and stuff that we've got to, we've got to get over. But um, I think that, you know, once again, one of our successes um, here at Bellevue Healthcare w within our organization and, and, and more close to like what I'm working on and Lexi helps um, with this is like, is, is the mountain that we're climbing and learning process so that we can come to the table like we are today and kind of discuss like what we know and, and how, how we get through that. And, you know, once again, it's, it's beneficial for us as well to see, um, to, to see something get, get approved and kind of learn how to, how to pursue that piece of equipment. Um, try. Yeah. Fun. I can add on to that. Yeah. Wash, when you look at the difference between like Washington and Oregon with like alternative fundings through the state specifically, Washington, um, cause I work in both, um, is definitely set up more friendly with easier access to those funds than Oregon is unfortunately. And that's one of the things, um, Derek had kind of mentioned earlier that group working with them of getting, um, like getting access to some of these things um, for those who are on the state funding. Um, so it's, it's getting better um, for Oregon. Um, it still has a lot of hurdles and humps to get over, but um, there are a lot of options. There was the mention of wheels to walk in there. They're a great company uh, or funding source to work with as well. They have a little bit more uh, uh, caps on kind of how much they can spend and stuff like that. But there are um, a lot of options still out there. Uh, we have some that we work with. Um, there's a lot, I mean, just the private ones versus kind of more state ones. And so I would just always encourage to, you know, just ask the questions of if we know anybody or what's the likelihood of getting this or that covered and stuff like that. So I would say it's just it's maybe not as straightforward, but there's, there's, a, there's always a path somehow. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lux. Um, so going back as more, you know, as the questions come in um, regarding like, you know, the equipment and, and the pursuit, um, I wanted to make a, um, a couple other um, comments regarding just, you know, some of the conversations that have happened out there, just some random questions that I could throw into the mix here. Um, 
you know, I don't know what everyone's opinion is as far as, you know, how long equipment is being is is taking to pursue, you know, how long um, is is it from what we call evaluation. So day one where we decide we're pursuing a piece of equipment all the way to when the when the client actually receives that piece of equipment. And I can imagine that across the board with different providers, um, both in our state and in Washington, um, you know, that there is uh, a pr probably a, a wild number out there. Um, my feedback on that has been that um, I, I can really only provide, you know, what how how quickly we're moving on on equipment. And to this day, um, right to the point, you know, we're we're still quoting people somewhere between, you know, 90 and 120 days, which which I think is is a little bit long, but, you know, a, th a three to four month period. Um, but but I know that that's been a hot question of like every time I go into an evaluation um, and we start going down this funding path for any particular piece of equipment, it's been like, well, the last one took this long or, you know, is it going to be a year till I get my chair? Um, and, you know, I know we've been talking about this for a year, if not decades. Right. But um, I, I feel like, you know, once again, my answer is kind of like, hey, this is how long it's been taking for us. And ultimately, if you're doing everything correctly as far as um, document, you know, the documentation process, the documentation gathering. If I'm doing my part in getting the things quoted out um, and into the system for the process, for the review, um, then there is a certain timeline with, and help me out, Lex, but there's, there's a certain timeline that all of these insurances have to review that and get some sort of, of response back. Hopefully in most cases, it's an authorization. Um, it, uh, or or a a asterisk that says and, and that's not a real thing but an as you know that says hey here here's the problem we have with a certain part and then we start to respond um and even the response is a pretty fast process to get back to them um once again working closely with your supplier or or, or you know directly having a direct connection between supplier and, and therapist um to to answer that question and then continue to move on and that's where we come up with our 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 outline of time. Um, now, obviously you guys all know the more complex the piece of equipment, for example, a power assist device, there may be more questions or there may be a little bit more pushback. Um, you know, with the new um, with the new legislation that's kind of in the works right now regarding like a seat elevator on a power chair or something um, where they're like, well, now they're starting to approve them, but a lot of people don't know that there's a lot of extra criteria that comes along with getting that approved. So in the end, during your documentation phase or during that, hey, wait for our, our authorization to come through, you know, they might need more information, which takes, you know, adds more time to, once again, that evaluation to delivery time. Um, and so um, I I think that the, the the best answer I could give regarding things taking any longer than that time that I just put out to you guys would be that um, either something is is missed and and is in line and just waiting on somebody's desk possibly or um, you know that there's a loss of contact with one or more parties um, you know somebody of the team you know ATP therapist doctor you know some family um, has has disappeared or is not responding. Um, that would be the only reason that you would see something drag out longer than that. Um, you know, um, the the last option would be that, um, and this still happens, that equipment suppliers would be supplying something um, that that isn't covered or um, um, you know that you had to dig into the plan itself. Um, Lexi might have a comment on this, but you might have to dig into the plan itself and realize that that service or that that piece of equipment is not a covered service. And you don't find out about that till three months after you started the process. And that's a very unfortunate waste of time. You know, so, um, you know, once again, on on our shoulders to kind of know those details. Anything to add there, Lex? Um, no, I, I think, you know, when you work with a, um, different suppliers and stuff, it's just. Um, knowing a lot of the information up front, do, you know, do they qualify for this? Do they not versus just kind of pursuing it? And that plays a big portion of it. And just that communication, um, I, you know, we talked about a lot at the beginning communication in regards to if something's broken or, you know, you need something tightened on a wheelchair or something like that. But it also is for like the new process or, Hey, I'm looking to get this. Like, what does the path look like? I think it's 
super important to ask those questions so you have an idea whether something looks very likely to get covered um, and what is that going to look like versus, okay, we could possibly do it, but here's the hurdles we could get to. And so I think just having all that information up front, just not, you know, not for all of us, just on the phone call, but also for the family. So they have, you know, that expectation up front of what, what is this going to look like versus I saw somebody and now we're, we're, what am I getting this? Like what's going to happen? You know, there is, um, you know, in our, how our insurance works here in the U S and, uh, everything there there's a lot of in between stuff that has to happen um before we can just you know be able to you know get someone their no, new device or fix the new device or whatever it be so i just think that's i think it always comes down to communication and just knowing up front what is it what does everything look like yeah to tag to tag on to that like um lexi made the comment earlier regarding like special review i mean that's our term for it Correct me if I'm wrong, Lexi. That's that's probably not the exact term that you go through, but you know, special review of something is is a door that was opened years ago. Um, you know, I, I would say just just by some of the equipment we were pursuing. For, for example, specialty beds. Um, for example, some random one-off device that really doesn't have coding. Um, you know that that needs some sort of of, of review. I, I would even throw like custom seating into that world now because the allowable for custom seating in Oregon is so low that um, and so low and so appropriate for the client that somebody like myself could walk into an evaluation and see that there is an absolute need for that and have no other alternative option as far as seating is concerned and have to pursue that type of equipment with the hit pick code that it has um, and and know that 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 product has to be put through special review to seek better funding but back on point here um, specialty beds some of these other pieces of equipment where our team and I would assume that there's a division of people with any of the uh, of these supplier organizations, Belby Healthcare, New Motion, those those companies that could get those ducks in a row and start the pursuit for something of of um, uh, high complexity and and that needs to be reviewed outside of the um, the the typical funding um, that's provided for it. Um, you know, and and needs the the medical reviewers to look at it and and understand, you know, what what we're pursuing and why we're pursuing. And um, hey, Greta knows what I'm talking about here. Like why we're why we're moving from a more standard bed to you know a, a, a more complex bed with high walls and and other details. Um, I, I'm picking on just a couple products right there, but you guys can imagine that um, the descriptions on a lot of this stuff is is, is not great. And how do we get from really, really basic durable medical equipment to, you know, some of the other offerings that are out there that that have real medical need, real safety features built into them and and pursuit and and are able to be pursued for for some of these clients. So Derek, I have a question for you. Yes, uh, uh, and so I, my mind keeps going back to have we answered all the questions related to bus transportation and and you know the individual wheelchairs that you're talking about. One of the uh, pieces of that first question that came in about the role of the therapist was who provides the straps for um, making sure that the wheelchair is, um, is secure on a bus. And so in going through those conversations at uh, ODE, they said, well, there is, there's one always on a bus. And so the question was, with all of the changes and, and, op and uh, options in chairs, is there a one size fits all uh, for a, a strap or whatever it is that secures a person once they're on the bus? Because because if there is something that is outside of what the bus driver normally has, of course, that takes additional conversation, but the bus company does not provide that. Mm -hmm. And so it, um, it, so it, it comes back to the, you know, the individual chair. And so I just wondered if you could comment on that at all, because the that's not in the bus driver's um, budget to buy extra straps. And when and you so, say straps, Debbie, you're talking about the straps that secure the chair, or are you talking about yeah. the straps that that um, security or safety straps that secure the child, or both? Are, are you talking about? Well, that? I guess I'm talking about both. Um, okay. 
because really uh, the strap I'm talking about for well, the strap to secure the student is probably one that the bus driver does not provide at all because that's really related to the chair itself, right? Yeah, but that's a, that's an interesting point to start on right there. Um, I think that um, and maybe I, things, maybe a non therapist like me has this all messed up, and everybody else on the call right. knows and is rolling their eyes. But go yeah, ahead. so so when we were ta- yeah, no, we were talking about equipment, and 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 this goes along with some of that WC nineteen um, qualifications um, um, provided in in those um, in the previous documentation um, that that you guys put out, and and our conversation last month. You know, the WC nineteen testing um, um, occupied and and non occupied uh, non occupied transit um, options on these wheelchairs um, it's a it's just a massive list but i would argue that a lot of the complex equipment out there um, the the more complex power chairs and definitely the manual chairs have their tie down points on them and and for everybody's imagination just imagine like a climbing carabiner hook welded onto the chair so that there is an access point for tying the chair down Um, When those aren't there, it's a very basic piece of equipment, very basic group two wheelchairs, um, meaning just consumer power, very simple stuff where you wouldn't have those just because they're not made. Um, And in that case, sometimes they'll apply, um, you know, the the very thick braided slash sewn straps to attach to the chair. Um, and to answer part of your question there, I think a lot of the time that's a bus company trying that way, you know, whatever. I don't know if it's school buses that will provide some of those straps just to hang off of the chair. And historically, I've seen that only done as a convenience place to to tie the chair down, meaning that, hey, here's the yellow or blue strap hanging off of the chair. This is the point where I'm able to attach my hook to secure the chair. Um, and that's been going on for for years and years and years. And, you know, I it's kind of, I kind of grin a little bit because it really is just a an, an easier access point for how to secure the chair um, when when you don't have one of the, the hooks that's actually truly welded onto that. Um, a step further. WC the WC 19 like occupied non occupied when you start getting into the occupied side of things, then we start having conversations about. Um, what the manufacturer is offering as far as security for the the client, him or herself, you know, in the chair. Um, and there is certain straps that are out there. In fact, I think that the spreadsheet, if I remember looking at it a month ago, um, had, you know, the list. And then it talked about whether um, you could put um, easy lock. Um, that's not the, the right um, term for it, but um, the the seat belts that were at the same quality as the seat belts um quality and safety as the seat belts that we see in our cars and they're usually um connected to a very strong robust metal clip that is above and beyond the seat belts that i use for positioning i want to be very very clear you know uh there's bruce bruce and i put on body point seat belts onto a chair uh, chest harness, a seat, padded seat belt, ankle huggers, um, all of these different pieces, those are not at the same level as what we have in our Toyota Tundra, you know, I mean, or, you know, our, our Chevy Suburban, you know, those, those are positioning belts, they're padded, they're super nice, they're very strong, but they are not rated for collisions or impacts. Um, and so what these companies will do is they will offer, um, you know, a, a, a I'm, I'm picking on one like Legero as a company that some of those chairs are out there. I think um, some of the other manufacturers have them as well, but they'll offer a, a, a seat belt with a push button that you would use over the top of those other belts to ultimately secure the patient in, in the, in the chair itself. Um, and that comes from the manufacturer side um, and, and from the supplier side. And, and we would just, you know, identify the, the offering there and what, what's available. Um, final top of that top of that pyramid is what the bus or personal vehicle has and then you start talking about straps that are going to come down from the wall or the side of the vehicle that are going to go past you know across the client's body and reattach to another point in the vehicle um i'm getting into a little bit of territory that's outside my scope but the idea is the same and 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 usually what happens then is is that you'll have questions from parents and from therapists and and people like myself that is well what's the proper position for the client to be in when they're when they're utilizing that harness 
Um, and we all know that there is some patients out there that cannot sit upright at 90, 90, you know, or, or a hundred degrees and have that chest harness run directly across their chest. Um, or they have other asymmetries that are, they're an issue there where they're, you know, where it just doesn't, it doesn't fit the same way. Um, and in those cases, you know, once again, like everything we've talked about regarding transportation and emergency, I think it's, it's seeking out the knowledge, um, or seeking out the information to find out like, Hey, what, what, what is, how appropriate can we get this? How safe can we get this? Um, and and then have um, the authorities <laughs> sign off on on that to, to, to make it work. Um, all of that with with positive, constructive, helpful, um, you know, pursuit, it, it, meaning not kicking the can down the road. <laughs> you well, know, and making I, sure that I appreciate <laughs> everything that you're saying there. And I keep going back to one of my original questions is what does the bus driver know? <laughs> If somebody right. is in substitute or if a principal somehow uh, gets on bus duty because of a shortage of people, um, you know, is there something that's consistent from one bus to the other? And the answer is no, including does the bus driver know that there are exceptions that this strap that is on my bus aren't going to work with? Does the bus driver know that whenever there is an emergency that there may be a particular way I have to get this individual off of this bus? And so that whole piece about training and and being part of the same conversations it comes back to again Derek communication and yep. uh, you know having plan b if you need a plan b but thank you for that yeah 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 I mean I, I once again it was it's such a it's such a dynamic conversation for last month and kind of continuing it on or whatever um, once again as I expressed earlier I'm probably getting more involved on like that emergency repair side of things, as opposed to, um, you know, as the, the direct angle and position of the harness, though I have g given feedback and provided a lot of information regarding um, body types and positioning, because it's a reality in my world as well. I mean, you, you can imagine how many times, you know, I've, I've probably been in evaluations where we, you know, we don't want junior sliding out of his chair. And, you know, it's like, well, he's at zero degrees tilt <laughs> and he has an open hip to back angle and a lot of tone. Like it, you know, we need to like, Hey, what, what can we do to change position? What can we do to make sure harnesses are in the right spot and holding somebody in that position? Well, well, the whole time recognizing like what the, what that person's body is capable of, um, you know, whether it's for a couple hours during a class or for, you know, the 15 or 20 minute bus ride home that, um, you know, is, is, uh, includes 27 speed bumps and slamming on the brakes all the time. Right, Bruce? Like people flying out of their chairs when the... <laughs> I, you can see, I get a lot of these stories and a lot of this stuff from, you know, real world situations that I know you guys are all, all dealing with. And, you know, once again, I hope that we're, we're a good resource for, you know, what's available or what we've seen or some sort of, um, and you know, Derek, you know, I know in an ever... In an emergency, it's not always a good time to watch a video of what this student needs. But certainly, if there is a, if they are a frequent bus rider, um, I, I've thought about: is there some way we can put a QR code on the tag on the that somebody could watch it and say, "Okay, this student, it looks like they've got some complex needs. Let me watch this to make sure that I know how to do that." That's a big picture problem solving. But as Jenny says, does the bus driver know how to lower the ramp? Well, there are so many things that we might have questions on about what they know and and where we come together. But um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and how many, I mean, in, in a stressful situation, which I know they're out there, I mean, I can imagine that there's um, not only not time to watch a video, but you're already panicked and stressed about it. I mean, I've heard of, I've heard of power chairs that, you know, rolled once they were on those ramps five feet off of the ground. And, you know, it was a matter of like, you know, Hey, the motors are starting to go out or, you know, somebody bumped the joystick and, and it, it, point there, meaning that like in those stressful situations, like, um, you know, know, try to know what you're doing, but also try not, you know, to panic or, or, you know, um, assume the worst, but just to like, oh, let's, let's make sure that doesn't happen again. Or let's, uh, instead of going forward out the bus, let's go backwards out the bus. Let's have more control over the situation. I mean, it's all just a big, you know, learning curve, probably. Right. I mean, and in, a, and in an emergency ride. Driver. 
<laughs> right in an yeah. emergency it's not right it's not now i'm going to take the time to watch this video but in the everyday bus transportation that somebody does back and forth it might not be something bad to uh, consider as how somebody could get that um just in time training if they haven't already done it so i know that there um we are coming close to the end of our time but i i'm sure that there's still questions that people have out there and yeah, you, so two. I saw two here. Um, um, one that's close, near and dear to my heart. Here, you know, getting the the um, communication devices. I mean, I've been doing communication, uh, not devices, but the communication mounts um, for chairs for years and years and years. Um, and you know, I think right at the gate, I, I haven't had any trouble with with getting those. And furthermore, I've started to see them. Um, let's say this outside my my scope a little bit. Um, I've seen iPads recognized now and other devices besides something like, you know, the full blown eye gaze unit um, that that, you know, the big heavy, heavy unit that 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 um, I always get scared to drop. <laughs> but, you know, that I've seen a lot of these other, you know, smaller tablets and different devices out there get coverage. I mean, I won't lie. I probably have seen um, randomly like, you know, cell phone holders as well. But um, more to the point, like, you know, the uh, the mounting I, I've been doing for for a long time um, with 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 people like Carrie, who's got a question here too, you know, and, and we have been writing in um, those, those mounts to the wheelchair orders. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen any issues with them and I've delivered quite a few lately. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Lex? No, no, as long as the justification's there and they're, what we do see a lot come back from the insurance companies is, do they have the unit and they're successful with it? meaning that they want to make sure, you know, this communication device or whatever the holder we need to get, that they've been using it, it's effective, and it's going to work versus we're going to try this. Can you pay for the the holder, or the mounts to be able to try all this out? That's where they will sometimes, if it's not very clear, have a few questions. But otherwise, if it as long as it's justified that those devices are being used, utilized, then getting the mounts has not been an issue. Um, Joanne asks, does BHC have pressure mapping system? Um, and does BHC AP do mold in place custom seating? I might need a little more information on that second part of that question, but, um, we do not have a pressure mapping system. Um, I know that some of the suppliers do most of the pressure mapping that I see done is at the clinics and a lot of the clinics have acquired those over the years. Um, pressure, I, I have mixed feelings regarding pressure, pressure mapping systems. Um, because you know the seating mobility seating probably more than mobility is kind of my passion um and what what we yield from that information um i, I think it's valuable um but sometimes there's so many other little like factors that play into that and until the entire team everyone involved understands um you know the the um, impacts of, of pressure and surrounding um factors with that pressure mapping is once again valuable but it's just giving us a small piece of information um you know regarding the seating system and how it works or how it's going to function or you know whether other what other environmental factors are, are coming into play there um atps do mold and play do you mean custom seating i mean do we do custom seating i'm, I'm assuming that's what it is like mold in place or 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 in general custom seating a absolutely in fact custom seating is not done enough um, because I think um, it's very involved. It's very expensive, as I talked about earlier. Um, there's a lot of process to it. Um, uh oh, I'm climbing up on a soapbox now. Uh, the custom seating in, in our world is very, in Oregon, is very, very tough, as I said earlier, because the allowable is very, very low, first and foremost, if not undoable at any. So if um, it, therapist comes to me, you know, uh, Nicole comes to me and she says, Hey, I'd like to do custom seating on a Medicaid client, and they just got their chair a year ago. Um, it's it's almost undoable, which brings in the topic of special review to seek out more funding, um, which I think is the right thing to do, especially when you see some of these students and clients that have um, such severe seating issues. It is the only thing to do, and so you have to make that choice and you have to go down that path. And it's a long one. We've already talked about that. Um, custom seating um, is intense. And there's a lot that's uh, there. There's a big 
there's a small margin of error, right? Like you have to have a lot of those under your belt. Um, you have to have certain products that you've used for a long period of time. Um, you have to know the intricacies of how it gets submitted to a ride uh, uh, designs or an Invacare pin dot or Promobile has theirs. I mean, there, there's a few out there, right? But you got to know how that flows through that, that system, what they need to see it. Uh, by the way, everyone, now um, the day, and I know some of you guys know this, the days of like putting somebody in a system and then wrapping a bunch of plaster around them to get their seating done, that's not a reality anymore. Everything now is 3D imagery. So it's big, for lack of better words, it's big topographical maps to show the body contours. And with that, it's awesome, it's fast, but at the same time, like you better make sure that that all of that process is done correctly and that they get all of that translated electronically across the country to their suppliers or to the manufacturers where then they can create the system for you. Um, then you're halfway there and then you get to get it in and hope it's right and put it on the chair and instruct the family, client, PT, everyone along the lines to basically how this thing works. If all of that comes together, it's, it's Christmas time. Like it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, but once again, all of that plays into why people don't do them. And I think first and foremost is the funding. Um, second in line is just that um, the, the amount of time to, to do it and energy to do it, um, you know, unless you're at a spot where you've done so many of them um, that I, I can't, I can't imagine even young, uh, newer, younger um, rookie ATPs, um, you know, going down that path unless they've shadowed or or gone to, you know, so many courses and training sessions to actually make that happen. Because uh, when it's not Christmas time, it's a total nightmare. So <laughs> anyway, um, so new question. Been there, seen that. What do we got? Um, where do you uh, recommend looking for funding for mounts in Oregon? OK, also clients. Okay. Um, the mounting, back to mounting question real quick. Um, uh, also for clients that already have mounts to at home, but need them as quick. Okay. So uh, what I take from that is, is the mount a um, um, external, like uh, take it around with you, like a table mount or something that's actually mounted on the chair. My experience, just going back to what I said earlier, has been mounts that we pursue that will be mounted on the mobility device. Um, those are the ones that we're able to get funded, though the insurance company usually has a record of what's been pursued. So um, to answer the question, I think it's tough to get another mount um, in addition to, to the mount you already have if you've got one that's been prescribed on the wheelchair. Um, uh, in that situation, what I would say is, is it possible to take, um, I'll give you like an example, like a Daisy, Daisy Tech mount, that's a table mount, uses a lot of the same parts and pieces that a wheelchair version would use. And so are we very, very close to just getting an adapter where that mount could could move from one piece of equipment to, to the other? Um, where, I've, where I've been successful, that's just a little bit different than that, would be that like when a client has a manual chair and a power chair, right? Or an activity chair and a power chair or something, and they they want to utilize their mount for both applications, you don't have to just get an entire, you know, whole nother unit. Is it possible to just get a receiver and be able to transfer one to the other without messing up the orientation of the actual eye gaze device or the tablet or whatever it ends up being? Um, you know, that that that's how we've kind of, you know, gotten past that. I mean, it, it, is it is it perfect every time? Pro probably not. But, um, you know, with the right tools and parts, you, you don't need too much to, to make that work. Um, it, it recommended funding for mounts. Um, Lex, would you, I mean, I, I would think that any, like, I would think that all of your normal outside funding agencies, like you referenced earlier, like Wheels to Walk, like, you know, would you probably, th this all falls under that. I mean, if you can't get it funded as an assistive device through, you know, one of the insurance companies, then I would say that all of the other funding sources come into play, right, for, for pursuing a mount? Yeah, yeah. I think um, to kind of answer that, first portion of that question is if someone already has a wheelchair, you can add it to it through um, insurance funding, obviously with an authorization. It doesn't have to be like in simultaneously at the same time as a wheelchair. It can be added later on. Um, we call that like modifying the wheelchair. We're adding something to it and we have to ask them if they'll pay for it. 
Um, and then as far as like, yeah, trying to get alternate funding to look at getting basically that secondary amount to maybe one keep at school and one to keep at home. Um, insurance is very much, they pay for one piece. Um, so they're not going to do two. So think of it kind of like, um, they're not going to have like someone's primary wheelchair and then pay for a backup wheelchair or something like that. It's the same kind of thing when it comes to these accessor quote unquote accessories. So these mounts is they're going to pay for one to use. Um, and so then you are looking at those alternate fundings like wheels to walk, um, DD services, things like that. Um, and just explaining again, why do, why do you need a second one? Why can't it be transported back and forth? Things like that. Um, but they're just like we kind of talked about earlier. Yeah, there's a lot of alternate funding. And sometimes the school districts have funds. Um, there's grants through different clinics. I mean, there's, there's a lot, um, I think, out there. It's just asking those questions.